When we go out to eat, we never agree on where to go. I want burgers! Pizza! Tacos it is. The one thing we do agree on is we all want unlimited high-speed data. That's why we switch to MetroPCS. Stop by MetroPCS with the whole family and get four lines with unlimited LTE data for just $100, period. MetroPCS. Wireless. Figured out. Coverage not available in some areas. Offers require reporting of number not currently active on T-Mobile Network. During congestion, the fraction of customers using more than 35 gigs per month may notice reduced speeds. Video streams at up to 40p. No tethering. See store for details and terms and conditions. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Nonprofit View, a forum where nonprofit stakeholders can share lessons learned and discuss the latest developments in the industry. My name is Valerie Leonard, your host. I'm a consultant to nonprofits, and I specialize in community and organizational development. I work with nonprofit organizations to help them make a stronger impact to their clients and communities. You can find Nonprofit U on Facebook and Twitter, and I encourage you to comment early and often using the hashtags Nonprofit U, The Law Project, or Nonprofit Compliance. You can also leave comments on the blogtalkradio.com forward slash nonprofit underscore for you. That's our website, and the chat room is open, and you can post comments and questions. In order to use the chat room, you must open a listener-only account, and I'm really happy to see there are quite a few of you in the chat room, so feel free if you'd like to start posting your questions. And you can also email me questions at consulting at valeriefleonard.com or send messages through Facebook and Twitter. You'll find a Nonprofit You fan page on Facebook, and the Twitter account is at Nonprofit You. And we'll be taking questions by phone and from the chat room at about the 20 minute mark. The call in number is 347 884 8121. Again, that number is 347 884 8121. Today's episode is The Rules of Engagement. Maintaining Nonprofit Compliance. We'll discuss various topics of nonprofit compliance, and this will include the board's role in maintaining compliance with state and federal regulations, differences between political activities, advocacy, and lobbying, and funding your organization through business activities. Again, we encourage you to call in with questions and to participate in live chats at about the 20 minute mark, although, if you're In the chat room, we encourage you to post your questions now. The call-in number is 347-884-8121. Nonprofit professionals and community stakeholders are especially encouraged to call in and share your stories. Our guest for today is Jody Adler. She's the director of the Law Project. Some of us know it as TLP. And this is a project of the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. TLP provides pro bono legal advice and education to nonprofit entities and to low-income entrepreneurs to further the project's mission of supporting economic development in Chicago. Jody has been with TLP, and this is formerly known as the Community Economic Development Law Project, For over 18 years, she specializes in the law of exempt organizations, working with community-based nonprofit organizations. Jody supervises a staff of four attorneys and one paralegal, and Jody was instrumental in developing TLP's seminar series that was offered to nonprofit organizations and the development of publications addressing topics of concern to nonprofit groups. She's a frequent speaker on issues of nonprofit board service and exempt organization concerns, and she regularly interfaces with private foundations, consultants, law firm pro bono coordinators, and technical assistance providers to develop services for nonprofit entities and entrepreneurs and transactional pro bono opportunities for attorneys. Jody was awarded a Wasserstein Fellowship at Harvard University for the 2011-2012 academic year, and she currently serves on the board of directors of the Chicago Community Loan Fund. Jody is a graduate of DePaul University College of Law and the University of Iowa. 
And that is the short version, Joey. You have accomplished <laughs> so much in so little time. This this is wonderful. So I, I thank you so much for being on Nonprofit You today. And it's indeed an honor to have you. Can you tell us a little bit about the Law Project and how you came to work with them? Sure, and thank you, Valerie, for having me. I'm excited to be able to do this um, and provide some additional information to people who are interested in maintaining nonprofit compliance. So I was a community I was a community organizer after I graduated from college, and I mm-hmm. used to take I used to take tenants who were living in distressed buildings down to building court to testify against their landlords. And I thought, gee, I'd be so much more effective if I understood what the law was, and that led me Uh to law school. When I went to law school, I was always very interested in getting back to working with community organizations. And so when an opportunity arose with the law project, I applied and started here as a part-time staff attorney. I have, like you said, been here for over 18 years and became the director of the project about six years ago. Um, The law project is only one project of the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. The other projects are educational equity, fair housing, the settlement assistance project. We have a voting rights project and civic engagement and a hate crimes project. Every project can include yeah, every project, including the law project, is committed to working to address issues of racial equity and community empowerment. The law project specifically works to strengthen communities through legal services. We do this by providing free legal representation to community-based economic development and social service organizations and to low and moderate income entrepreneurs. The type of work that our volunteer attorneys do for these organizations is really to address their business legal needs, such Mm -hmm. as if an organization is looking to lease a property, we can get an attorney who will review and negotiate that lease on their behalf or any other type of contract. Or if they have tax questions, we'll have an attorney who can help them address their tax questions. If an organization or a business is hiring their first employee, They need to know what the law is around hiring and what they can ask and what they can't ask and how they document who that employee is. Mm -hmm. And those are things that our employees, our attorneys can help businesses and nonprofits do. We also have a brand new program where we provide legal expertise and access to empower communities to have a voice in new development that may improve their community but negatively impact the current residents because of gentrification. We're seeing more and more communities in Chicago where people are getting attracted to doing big developments, and we Mm -hmm. want to make sure that the residents that currently live there have a voice in how those developments are going to impact them. The Law Project also provides legal alerts, neighborhood clinics, workshops, and webinars on topics that impact the running of nonprofits or small businesses from getting started to closing their doors. So that's pretty much the law project. Oh, that's awesome. You guys have really expanded since we spoke about a year ago, and I'm really interested. I I guess maybe one of the topics we'll talk about in the future will be your new program where you work with communities to balance the power between the residents and developers. That's very near and dear to my heart. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I know we're here to talk about nonprofit compliance and related issues. And I guess before we really go down the tangent, can you, you know, tell us what nonprofit compliance is and why it's important? Sure. So, you know, when you create a 501c3 organization or you run a 501c3 organization or a charity, um, there are many different laws that impact the operations of the organization. Some are federal, Mm -hmm. some are state, and some are local. And the failure to comply with some of these can really expose the organization to not only financial consequences, but penalties, and also, in worst-case scenarios, it can lose its 501c3 tax exemption. Um, And there are situations where if an organization is not in compliance, the Individual board of directors may end up being liable for costs Mm -hmm. that are involved. So there are serious consequences that can occur when an organization isn't in compliance. 
It doesn't really wow. matter what size the organization is. It can be a very, very <laughs> small organization that's run by volunteers that has a very limited budget or a very, very large organization. The majority of the kind of ongoing compliance requirements are still imposed. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that you may not have a paid employee. So it's wow. really important for organizations to know, you know, what the laws are that impact their operations so that they can maintain compliance. And ignorance is not a defense. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. <laughs> wow. So board members have very serious responsibilities, and like you said, it doesn't matter whether they know the law or not. They are always going to you know, be responsible. So can you give us a brief overview of their main duties and responsibilities and share with us their role in maintaining compliance and you know, compliance with regulators and other funders? Sure. So you're right. I mean, basically in nonprofit organizations, the board runs the show. They mm -hmm. may hire the executive director, and that's usually one of the tasks that they're responsible for, and then they may delegate additional responsibility to the executive director, such as running mm -hmm. the day-to-day -day operations or hiring or firing other staff. But ultimately, the buck stops with the board. The board mm -hmm. is ultimately responsible for what the organization does. Now, well, boards can take many different, you know, can be very many different shapes and colors, and they can be small and they can be large. But what happens is they act as a body. So the majority of the people on that board, if they decide that the organization is going to do something, then that's a decision for the organization. But each mm -hmm. individual director also has a responsibility to the organization, and those responsibilities are called their fiduciary duties. There okay. are three different fiduciary duties that apply. One is the duty of care. And what that simply means is that if you're the director on a nonprofit board, you must use the care of an informed person in a similar position when you make your decisions. That means mm -hmm. that your decisions don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be flawless. But you mm -hmm. do have to have the knowledge and the information required to make an intelligent decision that somebody else would make in a similar situation. Okay. One of the things that's nice about what the law has said about the duty of care is you can rely on professionals. So if you're on the board of directors and an issue comes up that you don't know the answer to, and maybe it's a legal question, and nobody mm -hmm. on the board knows the answer, you can hire a lawyer or you can come to the law project and see if you can get a volunteer attorney. But you can rely on professionals for information. The other duty is the duty of obedience. And what that means is that the directors must ensure that the organization is in compliance, the laws that we just mentioned, that you know, federal, state, and local laws, and that the actions are true to the organization's purposes and goals as set forth in their articles and bylaws. So if you're on the board, you need to know what your articles say and you need to know what your bylaws say. The third duty is the duty of loyalty. And Simply put, what this means is that you personally or a family member can't benefit because of your involvement on the board of directors. Mm -hmm. It means that you always have to put the interest of the organization ahead of your own interests. So even if you're sitting on the board and you're thinking about buying a condo and the organization <laughs> is thinking about buying a condo and you hear about this condo and you go, oh, my gosh, this would be great for my business. You can't go and make a bid on that condo because that would be taking an advantage of your position over the interests of the organization. The duty of loyalty is where lots of conflict of interests arise, and there's a process that the IRS has set out for handling those things. So as a board member, and we don't have time to go into what that process is, but as a board member, you have to know that there is a process that has to be followed if you're going to engage in some kind of financial activity that will benefit you or a family member with the organization. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, the board, each director acts with these duties in mind, and then mm -hmm. it's their responsibility to make sure that the organization is compliant, that they're filing their annual report with the Secretary of State, that they're filing their annual AG re report, that they're filing the IRS 990s. All of those things ultimately are the board's responsibility to either make sure they're being done or make sure the systems are in place to have those things being done. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's awesome. So listening to you, in summary, it sounds like you can't be a rubber stamp. You Correct. can't have conflicts of interest, and you have to obey all the laws that regulate nonprofits. Right. I mean, part of what the board is responsible for doing is what lawyers talk about as mitigating risk. And Mm -hmm. what that really means is it's the board's responsibility to make sure the policies and procedures are in place to, um, to, uh, to address, I'm sorry, I'm getting another phone call on my cell phone, which is very weird. Um, That to make sure the policies and procedures are in place so that the organization is not exposed to potential risk, meaning that the organization is going to be in compliance with the rules and laws that apply to its day-to-day activities. Okay, I got you. Thank you so much for clarifying and making this really, really simple. And then, sure. And I I look. If I can take one more second, I do want to clarify one more thing, which is about the conflict of interest. There is nothing. There is nothing automatically unlawful or illegal about a conflict of interest. It just has to be, there's a procedure that has to be followed to determine whether the the activity that's creating the conflict is unfair to the organization. I got you. So I can explain that in the way that if I decide that I want to do business with the organization, and mm-hmm. I make an offer to the organization of what I will charge the organization to do something. The board, okay. made up of people not including myself, because I have an interest in this that's personal, not for the organization, the board has mm-hmm. to determine whether what I'm offering is the best deal the organization can get. Okay. And if, and if the board decides that, then they can still enter into an agreement with me. But they have to have independent information to make that determination. Mm-hmm. Okay, that that is very, very helpful. And, you know, I look at the current political environment. We just had a, another <laughs> election, <laughs> and people are very, very engaged. And I am seeing not only citizens engaged, but, you know, a number of organizations are becoming more engaged. So I'm just mm-hmm. wondering if you can share a little bit about the differences between political activities and legislative activities and when it is or is not appropriate for tax exempt organizations and churches to engage. Sure. And I I think that people who who kind of work in the nonprofit sector have always heard that organizations can't be engaged in political activity and lobbying activity. Um mm-hmm. And I think a lot of us use those terms interchangeably. And Mm -hmm. so one of the things that I think it's really important for people in the nonprofit sector to understand is that from the perspective of the court and the perspective of the Internal Revenue Service, political activity and lobbying are very different things. The results of a nonprofit engaging in those two things are also very, very different. Political activity really is the act of an organization endorsing or opposing a candidate for office or the appearance of doing so. In Mm -hmm. that set, so it has to be a candidate for office, and so timing becomes critical. If somebody has just been elected and you want to take an action because they're not running for office, it doesn't fall into that narrow definition. But if an organization does engage in political activity, again, endorsing or opposing candidates for office or appearing to do so, the IRS can impose pretty severe consequences in in the form of penalties and taxes and also the loss of a C3 status. So we generally say to our organizations, do not engage in political campaign activities. You can do candidate forums. You can do voter registration drives, but they have to be done nonpartisan. And then Mm -hmm. you're okay. I mean, we we just went through an election, so we don't have another one soon, but there's great guidance from the IRS on this in Revenue Ruling 2007-41 that people can Google and they can read through the IRS gives fact situations and how they would interpret mm-hmm. whether it was political campaign activity or not. 
The other thing we were talking about is lobbying. And I think that a lot of 501c3 organizations misunderstand what the Internal Revenue Code says, which is basically that organizations can't be engaged in substantial amounts of lobbying activity. Mm -hmm. That that substantial word is what's critical. It doesn't say you can't be engaged in lobbying. It just says you can't be engaged in substantial amounts of lobbying. So the first question is to determine what lobbying is versus political Mm -hmm. activities, right? So lobbying is a communication or an activity directed at a legislator or their staff that refers to or expresses a view on specific legislation. Mm -hmm. And that's considered direct lobbying. So you need to have the communication or activity directed at a legislator or staff expressing a view or referring to a view on specific legislation. There's another type of lobbying called grassroots lobbying, and that's Mm -hmm. very similar to direct, but the difference with that is that's a direction to the general public to in contact a legislator. So I think everybody gets emails saying you should contact so and so about X Y Z. That's considered mm-hmm. X. That's considered grassroots lobbying. So it's the organization itself isn't lobbying, but it's asking other people to take a lobbying action. Why is okay. that important? That's important because. If you are concerned about whether you can lobby or not, there are two different tests that the IRS imposes. Mm -hmm. One test, which has been the test from the day the legislation went into effect, is called the substantial part test. And that takes us back to no substantial part of your activities can be engaged in lobbying. The substantial Mm -hmm. part test is pretty iffy. You don't really know when you've gone over the line to being substantial. There is nothing clear that tells you if I do 10% of my activity on lobbying, I'm okay, or if I do 5%, I'm okay. Generally Mm -hmm. speaking, organizations that want to engage in lobbying use the other test. The other thing about the substantial part test is not only do you not know when you've crossed the line and when you're going to get in trouble, but the substantial part test takes a look at the time that is spent, the money that is spent, the nature of the activity, and how important the legislation is to the organization's purposes. Mm-hmm. So if you're thinking about lobbying and you are, you're not comfortable with that fuzzy whether I'm engaging in substantial or not, There's another option which organizations can pick, and that is called the expenditure test. Okay. And you do that by doing what is referred to as a Section H election. It's not not available for churches or private foundations, but it is for all others. And it's a clear test. What this test says is if you have annual expenditures of $500,000 or less, you can spend up to 20%, that's a lot, $100,000 on lobbying activity. And of that, 5% of that can be spent on grassroots lobbying. So if you're interested in lobbying, we generally recommend that you take a look at the Section H election and consider choosing Mm -hmm. that because then you have this bright line test. You -hmm. certainly still have to be concerned about how much you spend, and you have to allocate that, and you have to report that to the Internal Revenue Service on the 990 but at least you have this bright line test. Right. Now, so if you question, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I know you have to finish that point, but a question about lobbying. So when we talk about lobbying, we're just talking about influencing the legislative branch. We're not necessarily talking about, you know, speaking with the judge and the judiciary or speaking with, say, a governor or a mayor or a president in the executive branch. We're just speaking of the legislative branch. Is that correct? That's correct. The other thing is that we're not talking about education either. So it's it's geared towards expressing a view on a specific piece of legislation. Okay, I got you. Now, you were finishing a point. I'm sorry I interrupted. No, 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 no. It's fine. I was just going to say if, if what happens if you use the substantial part test 
if mm-hmm. because you don't know when you've crossed the line, the the way you find out you've crossed the line is when the IRS comes knocking on your door. <laughs> Which is not fun yes, for yes, yes. And so right. at that point you need to hire an attorney or find an attorney to kind of represent you to negotiate with the IRS about whether it was substantial or whether it wasn't. The um the the expenditure test, however, provides that if you spend over that hundred thousand dollars, and I should say that that's a that's a sliding that amount goes up if your expenditures are higher. Okay. Um, and there's a there's a chart that you can look at that tells you how much money depending on what your annual expenditures are. But what that part of the law says is that if you go over the amount that you're allowed to spend on lobbying for four years in a row. You Mm -hmm. will then lose your C3 status and all the income will be taxed. But that's after four years of going over. Prior to that, there's a possibility, depending on how significant the amount was, that you'll lose your C3 tax. But the other option is that you'll just be taxed on the additional lobbying expenditures. So even the remedy on the other side with the Section H election is a little more secure than with just Mm -hmm. the substantial part tax. Oh, okay. Now, Jody, I am looking at our time check. We have about four minutes, and there were a couple questions I wanted to ask, and I see that we have at least one caller. I'm not sure if this caller actually wants to go over by about five minutes, if, if it takes that much. Mm-hmm. Okay, you get that. Okay, yep. let, me, let me check and see if this caller has a question. Sometimes people just call to listen. Uh, I just want to make sure. Um, There's a caller whose phone number is area code 312-931-0902. Did you have a question? Um, Okay, apparently um, no question. So um, my question to you is, you know, if an organization operates an activity and charges for the activity, what does it need to know to protect its charitable status? So, so that could be a product. It could be, you know, them engaging in some for-profit activity. How do they right. address that, and what do they, how do they um, report it? What requirements does the IRS impose? Sure. So, so there are lots of organizations that charge for their activities. And that's fine. There's not an issue as long as the activities that you're talking about are related to the exempt purpose of the organization. The Mm -hmm. issue becomes when an organization decides to engage in a commercial activity, so kind of starting to operate a business or some kind of regularly carried on activity that a for-profit business might also operate. If that activity Mm -hmm. isn't substantially related to its tax-exempt purpose, then the IRS will impose tax on that income. It's called okay. unrelated business income tax, mm-hmm. and there are a number of exceptions to the unrelated business income tax law, but basically it, it applies any time there are paid employees engaging in ongoing commercial activities and the organization is receiving income from those activities. Okay. If it if it is so so an example would be a job training program decides mm-hmm. to create a small bakery. And okay. as part of as part of the job training the Clients who are in the job training program are going to learn how to operate a bakery. Bakery. Mm-hmm. That bakery is going to be competing with other commercial enterprises, but because okay. it is so substantially related to the purpose of the organization, which is job training, the mm-hmm. income that it receives will not be taxable. But okay. another example would be a job training program, and it decides to start a business. We can use the same facts, actually. It decides to start a business as a bakery, but the Mm -hmm. people who are in its program have nothing to do with the bakery. 
Okay. So they're just hiring people who, you know, have bakery experience, who are not necessarily like long-term unemployed or low income or you're job challenged. So they're just mm-hmm. hiring people to operate this bank bakery to bring in mm-hmm. some income for the organization. If that were the case, the income that the bakery was bringing into the organization would be considered taxable. Okay. And at some point in either of those situations, if the income becomes substantial, and usually that means like more than what the organization is bringing in through fundraising, the IRS Mm -hmm. may then come in and say, not only do you have to pay tax on this money, but we are going to yank your C3 status if you don't spin this off into a separate legal entity because we can't justify your organization not paying taxes when another bakery has to pay taxes. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, it does. So it sounds to me like in that case it might make sense, and I think this is something you guys also do, is to help the nonprofit create a social enterprise that might be a subsidiary or an affiliate for the nonprofit. Correct. Is that what you're getting right. at? Okay. It, it, exactly. So one of the things we spend a lot of time doing with organizations that are looking at creating revenue streams is looking mm-hmm. at whether they can create something that's substantially related to their exempt purpose and then do it underneath the umbrella of the 501c3 or whether it's something that they should spin off into a separate legal entity related to the 501c3 but separate legal entity. Oh, okay. Wow, that sounds exciting. That that's that's another show unto itself. Yes, it is. <laughs> Get two more right. shows uh, out of this. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we've reached the end of our time, and I did want to give our callers, you know, an opportunity. If there are any questions, um, please, you know, let us know. Um, the guest call in number is. Three four seven eight eight four eight one two one. If if you have questions, and if you're in the chat room, if you have any final questions, you know, please post them now. And while we're waiting for people to either call or to chat, um, Jody, I just want to give you you know an opportunity to to wrap up and give us some final thoughts. And again, thank you so much for coming out. Sure, my pleasure, and thank you for the opportunity. I just want, you know, I just, I, there are a lot of organizations in Chicago um, that are very focused on helping nonprofit 501c3s kind of comply with the law and build their capacity. And so I just hope that folks who are listening take advantage of the services that are available, not just from the mm-hmm. law project, but from the other organizations that are around. If you are interested in more information about the law project or the Chicago Lawyers Committee, um, you know, feel free to come to our website or give us a call. The Lawyers Committee's website is clccrul.org, and the Law Project is just thelawproject.org right now. So I hope that people, again, will take advantage of the opportunity to get the information that's out there so they can really operate their organizations in compliance with the laws that affect them. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so again, Jody, thank you so much. And I want to thank our listeners for listening to Nonprofit You Blog Talk Radio today. Um, the show will be available for download within about an hour. And I think we've shared some really good information. And when I say we, I'm being generous by saying we. Yes, <laughs> Jody has given us some really wonderful information. Every time I talk to her, we can talk about this same topic. And I learned something new. It's, it's all almost like she's cutting my head open and pouring now. And so I, I, I appreciate you. You are that. too kind. Thank you. <laughs> so, again, the, the available within about an hour. If you know people who should have been on the line listening and they weren't, please feel free to forward this podcast on to them. And also be sure and join us next week. Our guest will be David Pendleton. And David is the executive director of the Door of Hope Rescue Mission. So until then, thank you very much for joining us, and you take care. Bye-bye. You have a sore throat, and you do not want to adult today. But you have real responsibilities and people are really counting on you. 
so it's time to think outside the bag. You need Sucrets medicated lozenges. Sucrets feature an effective oral anesthetic to relieve your sore throat and cough ASAP. And they come in a reassuringly sturdy tin that further demonstrates your maturity and good judgment. So adult on with the real relief that comes in a tin. Sucrets at Walgreens and Rite Aid. When we go out to eat, we never agree on where to go. I want burgers! Pizza! Tacos it is. The one thing we do agree on is, we all want unlimited high-speed data. That's why we switch to Metro PCS. Stop by Metro PCS with the whole family and get four lines with unlimited LTE data for just $100, period. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figure it out. Coverage not available in some areas. Offers require reporting of number not currently active on T-Mobile Network. During congestion, the fraction of customers using more than 35 gigs per month may notice reduced speeds. Video streams up to 40p. No tethering. See store for details and terms and conditions.